This is CBC Here and Now. It's been crazy. I mean, the winter was a long winter, road closures, ferry down. Stuck on the Labrador Highway. More troubles getting to Southern Labrador and the residents there are getting frustrated. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Navigating around the south coast of Labrador and into the strait is no easy task. The ferry that runs between the island and the Labrador coast has been riddled with delays. The winter weather has smothered the Trans-Labrador Highway, causing all kinds of closures. Reporter Jacob Barker is on the south coast today and talking to people about the nasty impact on their lives and their work. Well, I'm not the only one stuck here in Lodge Bay trying to get through to the Labrador Straits, but as long as that gate's closed, nobody is getting through. You get a taste of it all between Happy Valley Goose Bay and Port Hope Simpson. Huge stacks on the shoulders makes the road a narrow passageway. Drifting snow and on top of it all, a flat tire. Finally, arriving in Lodge Bay last night, I was greeted by a closed gate. Trucker Harvey Pike has been waiting here since early Monday morning. How do you keep busy? Smoke cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> For Pike, it's been an interesting first year behind the wheel of his truck. Oh, it's been crazy. Yeah. For road-wise, yes. Yeah. 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 I've been down there uh, a couple weeks ago. I got stuck for four days straight. Yeah. Same place. Yeah. Lodge. <laughs> Delays like this mean money out of his pocket. Oh yeah, I gotta hit the hard boat ways. I mean, the winter was a long winter, road closures, ferry down majority of the time. I mean, we're not making no money at all, right? Yeah. yeah. While the people who are moving the goods along the highway are getting hit hard, the businesses who are waiting for their supplies are feeling the pinch as well. Cyril Campbell runs a bakery and coffee shop in Port Hope Simpson. I think it's worse than when we're having stuff come in on boats, uh, seeing boats, because at least you were, had your stock in. He doesn't know when he'll get what he needs or what shape it'll be in when it gets there. We don't be open every day, but uh, if, if you don't have it, well, there's nothing you can do. Or, yeah. you know, you you can go to the other uh, other business and see what they got. And, yeah. But it's not what you can do when you can't get it in. While the closure is stopping goods from getting up the highway, it may also be holding up the news as well. My plan was to get to Lance Lou this evening to attend a public meeting about the ferry service across the Strait of Belle Isle. Whether or not I'll be able to do that depends on whether or not that gate opens up. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Lodge Bay. A young man has been charged in connection with this, the discovery of human remains in Conception Bay South last week. Now this happened during the early morning hours on Saturday. Police could be seen at a cemetery off Church Road in Foxtrap and an old railway bed behind Napa Auto Parts. Now, police say the remains are, quote, quite old and not tied to any missing persons cases. A 20-year-old man now faces multiple charges, including indecently interfering with human remains and possession of property obtained by a crime. He was held in custody while waiting to appear in provincial court. Well, a lot more cloud cover across the province today. We still have that low pressure system sitting off the coast and it's slowly starting to make its way further south. Eventually it will pull away, but those temperatures today uh, hovering above zero for most means we saw some rain and or snow through the afternoon. That's going to continue as we head through the night tonight. If we take a look at that future tracker and then into the day tomorrow, much of the same as far as uh, that rain or snow goes. And then we still have that winter warning or winter storm warning rather along the coast of Labrador. I'll have all those details and your full forecast coming up. Well, it's only Wednesday and already this week you got the calculator out. The uh, provincial government has announced $334 million in projects. And the projects touch nearly every sector from fish plant workers to infrastructure. Today, Minister uh, Leto and I are announcing. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to announce. And I'm very pleased today. A $2.5 million plant worker assistance project. Program. We will be committing more than $129 million. A new correctional facility for this province. A $100,000 annual program. And the week isn't over. Three more news conferences are set for tomorrow. The big announcement, though, in the days leading up to an election call, 
a promise to build a new $200 million correctional facility. The government says replacing the 150-year-old prison in St. John's is long overdue. Here and now's Mark Quinn has been following this story. So, Mark, what can you tell us? Well, Anthony, uh, Justice Minister Andrew Parsons expected to get questions about the timing of this announcement, and he most certainly did. So I can guarantee you that this is, has nothing to do about getting votes. It's about doing something that's been desperately needed for over a century. Many ministers were present for the announcement. They say replacing this old penitentiary will cost more than $200 million, and some of that money will be allocated in the budget next week. The Minister of Works and Transportation says the new facility will be built by 2022. The same timeline, same time frames as the new mental health facility, so it's a 30 to 36 month uh, start to finish. Jerry Earl represents NAEP members who work in Her Majesty's Penitentiary. Those prison guards have often complained about the difficulties of working in a decrepit, overcrowded facility, parts of it dating back to the 1800s. Uh, obviously, we'll owe this government or any future government's feet to the fire to follow through on this commitment. Now, according to the plans that were announced today, the new facility will be twice as big as the old facility, have twice the capacity, and it'll be up here in these hills, in the White Hills area, behind the RCMP. They plan to build it right up here in these woods now. Uh, some people have complained that that's an area where there are trails and bikers. Uh, they say those trails may be threatened by this new facility, but the government says it's going ahead with the plan, and they do say it will be done by 2022. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. Well, if Mark's story gives you a sense of deja vu, here's why. Plans for a new prison have been announced before. This is October 2013. The Progressive Conservatives held government and Darren King was the Justice Minister. In a big announcement from Confederation Building, King revealed the province would no longer wait for federal help and would replace Her Majesty's Penitentiary. We've been unable to convince the federal government to provide any support and any commitment. But we can wait no longer to begin the process. For the well-being of our staff and our inmates, we must start planning a new facility. So today, I am pleased to announce that the province is moving forward on this project alone. Well, the province is one step closer to banning certain types of plastic bags. Bill 1, as the new law is known, has finished winding its way through the House of Assembly and is now in the hands of the Lieutenant Governor for final approval. Well, the government says once that formality happens, there will be talks with the people who are most affected to set down the regulations of how and well, when the plastic this. bag ban will start. The ban is happening with the legislation that has given notice that the ban is happening. Let me be clear. We are banning the bag. And another government funding announcement, this one for community gardens in the province. Jerry Byrne, Minister of Fisheries and Land Resources, used the com community garden at the Autism Centre in St. John's as a backdrop to announce a $100,000 program to help the 75 established community gardens in the province and the ones that are being developed. Funding applications are online at the department's website. Each community garden could receive up to $500 annually to help with the cost of upkeep. What this does, this program allows for ongoing operational assistance, being able to buy small hand tools, uh, being able to uh, get soil enrichers, being able to, to uh, create some more raised beds. Small projects like that will make a big difference. But when it comes to their own money and not taxpayers, how financially prepared are the parties for an imminent provincial election? Well, each party was required to submit their fundraising totals and the overall balances they each have earlier this month. But there was a bit of a mishap. Here now is Katie Breen has the details. She joins us live from the newsroom. So, Katie, how do the parties compare when it comes to the money they've got in their war chests? Well, financially, one of the parties far outpaces the others. The Liberals have fundraised way more money and have a much larger war chest than the others. Let's look at some of the numbers. In 2018, the Liberals fundraised more than $835,000. At the end of the fiscal year, the party reported it had about $170,000 in the bank. The NDP fundraised roughly a tenth of what the Liberals raised. The party took in about $100,000 and, as of, as of last fiscal, had about ten grand in its account. Then there's the PCs. 
They missed their filing deadline, but their finances were posted online late today. The party fundraised about $110,000 total. They have about $15,000 in their account at last check. That's about $160,000 less than the Liberals. I spoke with PC leader Chess Crosby today before his party's finances were posted online. At that point, he didn't know what the bank account looked like. It's my job to be leader, and that doesn't require me to look after the finances of the party. Unless there's a problem, I'll get involved in it. But I have good people doing these things, and I trust them to do their jobs. Would you classify this as a problem, the fact that you've missed the deadline? I'd classify it as more of a technical problem, uh, and it's being dealt with today as soon as we found out about it. Crosby blame missing the deadline on the bank, and Elections NL says there is a penalty for that. $50 a day times the 10 days the PCs were late, and they're going to have to pay in $500. Live from the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Well, the owner of a newspaper chain across the province is suing the former owner. Saltwire claims that Transcontinental overstated its revenues and the value of its business when it bought the newspaper chain two years ago. Saltwire says that has led to losses. Transcontinental has 15 days to respond and none of the allegations have been proven in court. Meanwhile, Saltwire announced layoffs today and changes to some of its newspapers. The Western Star in Corner Brook is changing from a daily newspaper to a free community weekly paper. That'll mean job losses. And production of the paper will move from Corner Brook to Saltwire's offices in St. John's. The Western Star building is also expected to be sold in June. And two newspapers in Labrador, the Aurora and the Labradorian, will merge into one paper called the Labrador Voice. Those changes happen next week. It's going to increase significantly. Uh, by 2030, there will be over 12,000 people affected. Raising the alarm. The local Alzheimer's Society says we should be preparing now for the number of people who will be diagnosed with dementia in the years to come. That story next.
Welcome back to Here and Now. We're at the Alzheimer's Society of Newfoundland and Labrador here in Mount Pearl. We're going to talk about dementia. Um, so Shirley, give me a sense of where the numbers are right now. How many people in our province suffer from dementia? There are currently over 9,000 people uh, with dementia in our province at this point in time. Okay, and if we fast forward, say 10 years to 2030, what are we, wh how's it going to increase? Um, it's going to increase significantly. Uh, by 2030, there will be over 12,000 people okay. affected. Okay, so if I do the math, that means we're looking at about 3,000 more people? Correct. And I assume as Newfoundland's population ages faster, that number could accelerate, right? Absolutely. And given that that is the number of people diagnosed, it does not include the number of people who are impacted by the disease um, as a result of the diagnosis. Now, one of the reasons I came here to talk to you is because I want to discuss this whole notion of dementia villages with you, which struck me as kind of a novel approach. What is a dementia village? A dementia village is a person-centered approach to providing support for people to enable them to have their own individual choices, to all live in one central housing unit that they can avail of local stores and uh, different needs that they may have in the community. Right, so for somebody who is actually not afflicted yeah. by the disease, it might sound kind of like an, odd, an oddity that a village would have people wandering around, but this is not sort of zombies just left on their own, right? I mean, they're, they're supervised. G give me a sense of how they work. Well, they have staff who supervise their needs, but it allows the person to make independent choices with supervision. So they may have like a local pharmacy there that they can go to the pharmacy themselves with a staff person who may accompany them. They also have recreational choices, different options in terms of hairstyling places that they can go and get their hair done independently, which is quite different. What stands out to you as significant about this, this approach to people with dementia? I think it respects person, a person-centered approach, mm -hmm. um, allows people to make choices, allows them independence, uh, treats them with respect in a safe environment. Now, uh, obviously we have a different approach right now in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. I guess this is probably far off for us. It is most commonly in European countries right. at this particular point in time, um, and it may be something, I guess, of the future uh, that could be considered. And there's also one opening in Canada this year. There's one in uh, West, right? Correct. That's supposed to open uh, next year. That's an 84-bed unit, uh, BC. Right, in, in Langley, British Columbia. So give me a sense right now, if you have dementia, what's the best kind of care you can get? Well, the type of care that a person would avail of with dementia depends on their needs. Mm -hmm. So there are certainly options um, in the community of adult day programs, um, as well as personal care homes and long-term care facilities. Right. Now, one thing I should point out about these dementia villages, they're not, uh, you know, th these things are not inexpensive. I think the ones, the one in Langley, I think we're looking at $7,000 a month. Uh, even the one in Holland is about 7000 but it's subsidized by the government. Right now, what are we looking at in terms of cost? If you're if you're paying the if you're paying for your mom or your dad yourself. Um, well, our costs are less than that at mm -hmm. this particular point in time, but I guess with the growing number of people with dementia, um, there's going to be a need for more investment in those types of care options for people to have independent choice. All right. So who knows? Maybe someday we actually will see a dementia village in Newfoundland, and Labrador. Yes, indeed. You never, you never know. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Order your tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. That was very interesting. Yeah, we'll see where it goes. It's, um, I, I think we said there's one in Langley, but there's a whole bunch apparently. There's eight in Canada that are going to be built in the next, wow. over the next year. So it seems to be the wave of the future. Yeah, and with 12,000 12, Yeah, people. in 10 years, there'll be a lot of people. So yeah. it's, you know, it's coming. So we'll have to deal with it at some point. Okay, totally shift gears mm -hmm. uh, from people as they get older in life to some <laughs> younger people. You had a special call today? I did. I got to uh, speak to a grade four class in uh, Bay Roberts, Mr. Mercer's class. And that's them there. They were, it was actually quite cool. Technology mm -hmm. is pretty awesome. So we this is um, Amalgamated Academy? It is, yeah. We talked uh, about some weather. They had some great questions and then read them a book for Literacy Week. Oh, Cute nice. pictures, too. Yeah. What did they ask you? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> How much I make. Oh, uh, yeah, that's always it. Who, who does your hair? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why do I love my job so much, which is an amazing question. They did their homework, knew I was a pilot, asked where I got my pilot's license. Yeah, it mm -hmm. was really, it was nice. It was really great. Good. Yeah, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Nice. <laughs> Perfect. 
So what's happening with the weather? Yeah, well, we saw a little bit more cloud cover, as I mentioned earlier today. If we take a look at the satellite, you can see that low still spinning offshore, slowly making its way further south. And uh, with that, we saw some more precipitation today, especially across the island. So here's a look at the current satellite, or at least the last couple of hours from satellite and radar. See that snow along the west coast. And then for the Avalon as well, it's generally looking at wet snow through the day today. As those temperatures drop, though, through the overnight, we are going to see things change over to snow, uh, particularly uh, some onshore activity for the northeast coast as well. Wouldn't be surprised to see that tonight. And then uh, continuing along coastal Labrador. So that winter storm warning still very much in place for Postville to Makovic. Again, not anticipating that this will end at least until tomorrow afternoon when things should taper off to flurries tomorrow. So here's a look at the forecast overnight tonight. Again, starting to creep up, so milder than we saw this morning. Minus 4 by, for Corner Brook, minus 2 for Port Basque. Again, looking at the uh, either wet snow changing wet snow or showers changing over to flurries as we head through the overnight tonight. Minus one for St. Anthony. Those winds not quite as strong as yesterday, but still out of the west, gusting upwards of 40 kilometers per hour. So northwest winds for uh, the west coast near 20 kilometers per hour. And then up through Labrador, minus 10 for Nain. Clear skies generally, uh, essentially from Hopedale to Happy Valley Goose Bay and towards the Straits is where we're seeing most of that snowfall. Zero degrees for Cartwright tonight. Still looking at those northwesterlies, which means zero uh, reduced visibilities along the coast, uh, certainly. Minus 14 for Lab City under clear skies tonight. Taking a look at that snowfall, it's starting to uh, ease up a little bit. Still looking at about 10 centimeters of snow, especially for inland areas around uh, Cartwright. And then same for around Makovic, otherwise a trace to uh, five centimeters. And we won't really see too much more accumulation through the day on Saturday and that's or rather Thursday. And that's because that low will finally continue to uh, pull off. So we should see everything change back over to uh, or at least taper to flurries with high pressure moving in, which bringing some cooler temperatures, but very much uh, a similar forecast through most of the island tomorrow. And that's because those temperatures will be sitting above zero again tomorrow. So north, the winds will shift essentially from westerlies to northwesterlies through the day. Five degrees in Marystown, likely looking at uh, either rain or showers. Again, very much like today, a little bit Probably more cloud cover tomorrow. Uh, Grand Falls, Windsor, Gander, Terra Nova, Tulangay all sitting at zero to, or rather three degrees tomorrow. Towards the coast, again looking at that potential for a few flurries. Burgio should see some sunshine. Corner Brook, two degrees. Generally, the south coast will actually be where you'll see most of the sunshine. Uh, Lanzalou, three degrees. Cartwright sitting at one. And then still holding on to, at least for the first half of the day, some uh, windy conditions along the coast with northwesterly gusting near 60 with that snow. And then we should see some clearing skies. Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus 2 tomorrow, heading west. Plenty of sunshine thanks to that ridge of high pressure. Again, cooler temperatures, though, sitting below the seasonal mark. And that looks like that will continue for at least a couple more days. And then we'll start to warm up again. But I'll have all those details coming up in a little bit doubt that they don't want to go, but uh, frankly, I don't care. Cabinet Minister Andrew Parsons hasn't held back in the past. No, and up next, the latest on the business case to yank Marine Atlantic and about 20 jobs out of St. John's and relocate them to Parsons Political District on the southwest coast.
Welcome back to here. Now, will it stay in St. John's or possibly move to Port of Basque? Yeah, it looks like we'll have to wait a little longer to learn the fate of Marine Atlantic's headquarters and the 20 employees who work there. Terry Roberts tells us why. Marine Atlantic's headquarters is located right here inside the Bain Johnston building in the city's downtown. Yearly leasing costs of more than $400,000. But the main reason for its existence is way over here in the Cabot Strait, Port of Basque as the gateway for this important transportation link with the rest of Canada. So last August, Marine Atlantic's board of directors quietly hired this company and this economist to do an analysis of the business case for moving the HQ to Port of Basque. The company was supposed to complete its report by the end of December at a cost of 52000 the area's MHA, not surprisingly, fully on board. I think there's an economic case to be made that the work can be done there and could, can be done cheaper, and that is going to result in savings for everybody that needs it. As expected, the employees who might be affected have concerns. But when asked about this in February, Parsons offered no sympathy. No doubt that they don't want to go, but uh, frankly, I don't care. I do not care. I think that's a baloney argument saying recruitment retention. The fact is that's an argument because they don't want to move. So I would say too bad. But now there's a wrinkle. Marine Atlantic President and CEO Don Burns is leaving the top post in May. And the federal government is now searching for a replacement. So the whole review has been temporarily placed in dry dock. Marine Atlantic has refused all interview requests on the matter, but issued this statement. The report will not be completed without input from the individual appointed by the Government of Canada. As a result, there is no firm deadline for the completion of the report. Now, as you might expect, this is a very sensitive issue. The employees here at HQ could potentially have their lives uprooted. While in Port of Basque, there's the benefit of possibly bringing new jobs to that Southwest Coast community. This latest wrinkle, well, it's only prolonging that uncertainty. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. A double lung transplant survivor from Grand Falls, Windsor, says the province needs to step up financial support for patients who are given no choice but to relocate to Toronto for the procedure. Wendy Woolridge, who lives in Grand Falls, Windsor, says having to relocate for her 2016 transplant came at a huge financial cost. She says that while the province provides $3,000 for a monthly allowance to live in the city, that barely covered the cost of her $2,700 rent payment. Toronto is seeing record high rental costs and is now the most expensive city in Canada. Health Minister John Hagee says the allowance won't be increasing anytime soon. He says it's the best the government can do in its current financial situation. Nova Scotia offers $1,500 a month and PEI a thousand. Uh, so I think we're well positioned. I think we've got one of the most generous medical transportation um, reimbursement schemes uh, in the country. It is obviously a challenge for these individuals and I appreciate that but I think uh, a we're more than competitive and my information is that currently uh, certainly accommodation costs with meals on top could be covered by the uh, the reimbursement we provide. Well, to another serious health story now growing concern about measles outbreaks in the United States and across Canada is prompting a woman in Ottawa to speak out. Now, she contracted the disease because of a cancer treatment that she had, which weakened her immune system. And now she's calling on anti-vaxxers to get immunized so that other vulnerable people won't get sick. Evan Dyer has that story. And when that test came back positive, it was like, no, it's measles and we have to, uh, we have to really think about this. It was supposed to be the trip of a lifetime, a gift from a cancer charity. Jada Kelsall is a huge Harry Potter fan and she chose the UK. About a week after we got back, I started to uh, feel quite tired on the Friday night. That was followed by a high fever and a rash that landed her in hospital. But the measles diagnosis was a shock because she's been vaccinated. I tested positive for the vaccine antibodies, which means that I should have been immune. But Kelsall's immune system was weakened by chemotherapy. She spent eight days in hospital, five in an isolation ward, while public health officials warned the city. I was reading people's comments assuming that I was an anti-vaxxer or, or all these things and calling me names and uh, like the Reddit feeds were awful. People saying that my parents should be put in jail and stuff for not vaccinating me and that's ridiculous. Like they just didn't understand that it's not just the 
anti-vaxxers that are going to get sick. Kelsel knows her immune system is weak and even got an extra booster shot, but that wasn't enough to protect her because of her cancer treatment. What protects vulnerable people like Kelsel is everyone else getting vaccinated. We call it the elimination threshold, which means that there's enough people who are vaccinated to prevent the virus from circulating in the environment. And that's really where we are in Canada, but that's at risk. So when we have a collection of people who are not getting vaccinated, you're creating a pocket where the virus can circulate. Right now, the pockets of low vaccination are in Quebec and B.C. Even though she initially feared backlash, Kelsel is now sharing her story and her message for anti-vaxxers. Why? <laughs> Why would you want to risk exposing yourself to something that not only could affect you so badly, but anybody around you who's not vaccinated or who's vulnerable? Just do it. Do it for the people around you who can't. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Wow. That's quite the backstory there too, Carolyn, because she was taking a beating online because mm -hmm. people thought she'd brought it back without realizing that she actually had been vaccinated, right? So it was pretty brave of her to speak to out. To tell her story, yeah, yeah absolutely. Innocent person. Mm -hmm. There are 9,000 people in Newfoundland and Labrador who suffer from dementia. In 10 years, there'll be 3,000 more. To take care of them, maybe we should put them in villages. That story coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. Earlier in the show, I spoke with the CEO of the Alzheimer's Society in the province about dementia villages. Now, it's a concept that many call the future of care for people with Alzheimer's or dementia. It's already being tested in the Netherlands and even here in Canada as well, particularly on the West Coast. Patients with varying stages of dementia live in homes in a seemingly normal community. There's a grocery store, gardens, uh, and all kinds of interesting things and places to go. But behind the scenes, the village operates as a nursing home with staff working there to care for the residents. Well, back in 2015, two women from the University of Alberta visited one such village outside Amsterdam and let them tell you more about it. It's very different, uh, especially from anything we have in, in Canada. Uh, it's a different approach. And I think uh, one of the comments we made was that it was, it's very common sense to have uh, fresh air be important for people with dementia. If it was such common sense, I'm not sure why for the past 50 years we've been locking up people with dementia. What we've noticed 
um, in traditional nursing homes is that people with dementia, certain kinds of dementia, and it's not everybody obviously, um, when they don't understand where they are or their environment, there can be a lot of fear and a lot of anger. And so it acts out in certain ways. Maybe people will want to wander, or maybe they'll act out aggressively, or maybe they'll just sit and do absolutely nothing, not even eat. Um, what we've noticed is our skin our remembers, our smell remembers what home feels like, and it can comfort. And if people are in environments that can remind them of what home is, they will act as if they are in a home and they know how to be in a home and they know how to act when they feel comfortable. And that is, uh, that is more normally. So they are more likely to do things like eat when they're at a dinner table. Uh, they are more likely to bathe when they, see the op when they see a nice room for bathing and these sorts of things. So um, the environment absolutely normalizes the feeling which has affected behavior. There have been several beautiful examples that we've seen. Uh, one lady, or one resident, she uh, was really wandering and wanted to go outside and nobody stopped her. You know, they came and they, they had care in that they wanted to make sure she had a coat, but she could go out at any moment. Now this seems very simple for us because we're used to being able to go out, but for somebody like that, it's, it's not so in a normal facility. Generally, the doors are locked and no going outside. I think a lot of care staff traditionally have been trained by a medical model. So what this means is that they are used to applying healing to a resident. They are not trained, nurses are not trained, nor are caregivers very largely, to look for those opportunities for daily engagement that will help quality of life. Um, instead, we are very focused on um, the medical aspects, getting through the medication assistance, getting through the bathing, what are these tasks. So to crack open uh, the thinking of the caregiver from just the tasks to the every moment of our lived lives is important. It's a challenge, and it's a challenge globally. One of the things that's done quite beautifully is this balance of keeping people safe and secure and comfort coming with that, but then balancing that also with the practicalities of daily living, but also the joys of daily living and making sure people really have joy in their lives. And that is something, I think one of the biggest surprises that I found here was just seeing the, so much joy. It's really just demonstrated in that, that daily sense of, of joy, those spontaneous moments. What an interesting idea. Well, staying with seniors, for most, retirement is a time of winding down after a full life. But for one transgender woman in Manitoba, the later years are all about starting over as the person she was really meant to be. The CBC's Nellie Gonzalez has that story. It feels okay. While most people her age are making plans for retirement, Lynn Frost is getting ready to start her new life as a woman. Very excited. A little nervous too. I've never had surgery before, so. This is her fourth laser treatment so far. One of many the 63-year-old will need to complete her transition this year. Frost is also on hormones, taking voice lessons. But the big step in her transition will be when she has breast augmentation surgery. I have a, like I have a goal to complete my life as me. Frost says she's been waiting a long time to get to this stage in her life, and she doesn't think there's anything wrong with making the transition at 63 years old. But it's been a struggle to get to this point in her life. Because when I was living the male life, which was the other life, I wasn't happy. I was always having problems, I was angry, I was mad, so I had to make a choice of what to do, so I made the right choice when I did this. But her journey to get to this point hasn't been easy. She was bullied as a kid and has felt alienated by society most of her adult life. Like I've run into problems where people have just have a difficulty with me, like on the bus or in the malls or something like that. I'll, I'll sit down, I'm not bothering anybody, and then they'll see me and they'll get up and they'll move someplace else. So. 
She says her mother disowned her. But when I called my mother, I didn't think I'd have that much of a problem, but I ended up having a problem. She told me that, quote unquote, if I ever call her or visit her, she would call the police. And that was the end of that discussion. Frost says it wasn't until she reached her 60s when she felt confident enough to go through the rigorous process of applying through the province to get breast augmentation, which for her will be funded by Manitoba Health. For Lynn, she says she is slowly becoming more comfortable in her own skin. I see a beautiful transgender female who has a beautiful heart and a passion for life. Nellie Gonzalez, CBC News, Winnipeg. Welcome back, everyone. Before we get to the weather, though, mm -hmm. uh, they're at it again. Comedy team, yeah. not quite, have come up with another creation. Yeah, this one is uh, rated R for uh, risque. And so we bring you Fifty Shades of Bay. Takes uh, kissing the cod to a whole different level and cooking it to won't be quite the same ever again. Yeah, for sure. I think that might give me nightmares. Uh, but if you do want to <laughs> see that again, uh, you can go to our YouTube page, uh, YouTube slash CBCNL, uh, and, uh, you know, go ahead and watch it yeah, again. We don't that's judge. That's true. Yeah. Yep. And there are other videos there from uh, the Not Quite team as well. Yeah. So there you go. You're awfully silent. <laughs> Yeah. Having fish tonight, are we? <laughs> nope. Not for a 
while. Nope, not anymore. <laughs> no, not anymore. No, certainly not. I don't not. know. I thought it was pretty funny. It, it was interesting. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, yeah. Segway. Need yeah. a segue. Don't, don't have one. No. Don't have one. We're going to move to uh, Friday. So let's talk about Friday. Uh, after that low pressure system that we've seen for quite a while, essentially since Monday, that's finally going to move off. And it looks like Friday should actually be quite nice. Plenty of sunshine in the forecast. Those uh, winds still going to be out of the northwest generally, but temperatures overall uh, not too bad. So we're going to sit more than likely above zero, well above zero for parts of central. Otherwise, two to three degrees, these temperatures could bump up one or two more degrees depending on that sunshine. And then up through Labrador, above zero as well. Lab City, not so much, sitting around minus two, but it should be plenty of sunshine right across the board. And then the next system rolls in for Saturday, it looks like. So cloud cover to start. Then things get a little bit messy. Right now, those temperatures should be above zero. So if it's going to start off as snow, it'll start off as a wet snow. Quickly change over to rain overnight on Saturday. Northern Peninsula is still going to be in that snow. And then up through Labrador, it's going to be a snow event right through Sunday morning. It's slow moving, uh, so it's going to take its time moving across into Sunday afternoon. Still going to see that snow potential for the Northern Peninsula. And then along the northeast coast, we're looking at uh, that rain and or freezing rain. Eventually that moves off and then Monday looks like a pretty nice afternoon. Now looking ahead even more so into the beginning or rather the middle of next week, we could see uh, the potential for another storm. So Monday looks nice, but then that cloud cover moves in and it'll be another slow moving storm. That one could bring uh, some significant snowfall in some areas. Again, it's pretty early, so depending on where that rain snow is, but just a heads up that something is on its way next week. So here's a look at uh, the next five days. Thursday, or rather tomorrow, uh, for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland, we're looking at uh, some winds out of the northwest, still gusty near 60 kilometers per hour, four degrees. And then uh, sunshine through Friday and Saturday, Sunday, uh, rain or snow. Eventually it'll be snow towards the evening hours. And then Monday looking at some showers and three degrees for the first half of the day and then some clearing skies. Uh, Central Newfoundland, same thing tomorrow with some wind, either rain or flurries through the afternoon. Seven degrees on Friday. That's the beginning of some uh, above seasonal temperatures right through Sunday with either rain or snow. Again, the reason why it's there is because uh, when that snow falls, it'll potentially change over to some flurries. And then Monday, same thing at five degrees. For Western Newfoundland, two degrees tomorrow. Some northerly winds out of the... Uh, between 30 and 50 kilometers per hour sunshine on Friday and then again rain or snow for Saturday and Sunday with uh, showers for Monday again for the first half of the day and then some more cloud cover pushing through towards evening hours. Eastern Labrador flurries tomorrow. Th things will eventually taper off thanks to a ridge of high pressure. Your temperatures should be above zero into the beginning of next week uh, but that's not the case through Western Labrador. So sunshine because of that ridge of high pressure Minus four to minus two, that's below seasonal. Should be hovering around one degree to, uh, around this time of year. Snow moves in Saturday thanks to that next system. Sticks around through Sunday and then flurries will continue on Monday. So that's a look at your uh, outlook. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Carolyn? Thanks, Ashley. Well, here's something very cool for the science lover in you. An international group of scientists has dug up something big. They've captured an image of a black hole millions of light years away from us. And as the CBC's Cass Rusi reports, it has the space community looking forward to a brand new era of discovery. Yes. The first ever image of a black hole. We are delighted to be able to report to you today that we have seen what we thought was unseeable. Scientists describe it as a monster. At a supermassive black hole that's almost the size of our entire solar system. This black hole was found in a galaxy called M87, 55 million light years away from Earth. The image might be a bit fuzzy, but it does show the inner edge of the black hole, the so-called event horizon, the space where the gravitational pull is so strong that even light can't escape. Surrounding this is a bright orange ring of fire caused by superheated gases and dust that orbits it. Nature has conspired to let us see something that we thought was invisible. 
Getting to this point was years in the making, involving 200 scientists from 20 countries. It took an Earth-sized effort to capture this first-ever image. Not one, but a network of eight giant telescopes scattered around the globe, collecting millions of gigabytes of data. One of the Canadian scientists involved in this endeavor says finally science fiction has become science fact. This marks the beginning of a new era in astronomy, a new era of, of research into gravity, um, and we really just are standing at the threshold today. The image confirms what scientists believed what a black hole would look like, but also it shows that Albert Einstein's cosmic theory of relativity about the force of gravity was right all along. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. <laughs> yeah, told you. Yeah, <laughs> yes. that's amazing. It's so neat. <laughs> Fantastic, amazing things indeed. In other news, the federal government is defending a proposal that would prevent certain asylum seekers from making refugee claims in Canada. The priority has been to ensure that Canadians can continue to have confidence in our uh, asylum system, in our refugee system. Now, the change is meant to stop what the Trudeau government calls asylum shopping. And that's when a person who has asked already for asylum in another country makes a claim in Canada as well. The federal government wants to stop that, particularly if the original claim was made in the United States or four other countries with similar refugee regulations. The critics say the change would strip human rights protections from vulnerable refugee claimants. Well, the health of the Dalai Lama is being watched carefully today. I pray for His Holiness uh, to recover soon. The 83-year-old Tibetan spiritual leader is in hospital in New Delhi for treatment of a chest infection. The Nobel Peace Prize laureate was airlifted there yesterday from his home in northern India. Aides say he's in stable condition but will remain in hospital for a few days. The Dalai Lama fled to India after China took control of Tibet in 1950. In other international news, the fate of the UK is back in the hands of the European Union. Leaders from the EU's 28 member countries have gathered in Brussels for an emergency summit. And that's where British Prime Minister Theresa May is appealing to them in person to postpone the deadline for a Brexit deal. Well, I've been clear that the UK's request is for the, uh, an extension to the 30th of June. Uh, I have been working to make sure that we can leave the European Union. Indeed, we could have left the European Union by now, but Parliament didn't pass the uh, withdrawal agreement. So we need that extra time to work to ensure that we can get a deal through Parliament that enables us to leave in a smooth and orderly way. May is asking EU leaders to extend this Friday's deadline on Brexit until June, but some members are considering an even longer delay. If none is given at all, Britain could crash out of the EU at the end of the week without a divorce deal in place. A decision on an extension is expected late this evening. Now you may recall a few months back that clothing donation bins were under scrutiny. This after the death of two people in two separate incidents. Well, a Canadian city that banned those bins is bringing back what it calls a safer model. This is the new design the city of Delta in BC has approved. It's meant to stop anyone from climbing or falling inside. The new model comes after at least seven Canadians died in bins in the last four years. Delta removed the containers after two bin related deaths in West Vancouver and Toronto three months back. So far, the city has only approved eight new bins. Here's the picture of the day today. It's kind of hard to tell what's clouds and what's blowing snow. Wow, that's that is a, neat. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a really cool photo. Uh, this picture was taken on the west coast. Okay. So I'll let you take a guess, and uh, I'll tell you where it was taken when we come back. Perfect.
Welcome back. Well, we have an adorable viral video to show you now. Right, basketball related, not the St. John's Edge, but from a basketball court in Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> these five-year-olds, they're at their very first practice and they were told to huddle by their coach, but heard cuddle instead and then they took it from there. So <laughs> quite an adorable mix up yep, there. There they go. The video was taken by one of the children's dads who then posted it to social media saying, maybe we can all learn something from these kids. <laughs> that's, that's quite something. Absolutely yeah. adorable. <laughs> okay, everyone, cuddle. <laughs> yeah, it's basketball. I'm glad they didn't ask them to dribble. But anyhow, uh, that'll be the sequel. Now to Ashley's picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take a look yes. at that one again. <laughs> sure. <laughs> there it is. There, as the blowing snow looks like uh, looks like clouds. It does. In some cases, yep. so it's taken on the west coast, as I mentioned. Can I get that as my screensaver? That's fantastic. It, it be, is. You know? It is actually yeah. a really cool screensaver. So it was taken uh, Bay of Islands, looking out. So I'm assuming. Oh yeah, beautiful uh, place. A beautiful place. Yeah. yeah. This is the. Uh, North Arm Hills. Yeah, you got to go visit there, Ashley. Yes, I, I have to visit the West Coast for sure. So, oh, yeah. Winston, um, I'll send you the royalties yeah. for the screensaver, uh, <laughs> Winston. <laughs> It's yes. gorgeous. Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Well, that wraps up this mm -hmm. uh, edition of Here and Now. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Yep, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Good night.